Hey guys, this is Melissa with Love Covered Life, and today we're going to talk about the most commonly used argument in evangelical Christianity today to support the doctrine of eternal conscious torment in hell, the free will argument. But God cannot violate our free will. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't, and don't forget to hit the like button and talk to me in the comments. Largely, Christianity has moved away from belief in a God who actually literally takes people and throws them into a burning fire. Most evangelicals shudder at the thought, and honestly, as someone who's been there, we try to distance ourselves from that view of hell and pretend that that isn't where our current belief system evolved from and that many of our church doctrinal statements actually still teach this. All of that aside, while there are still definitely infernalists of the old-fashioned variety around, the more soft-hearted among evangelicals today would say something like this. Hell isn't necessarily literal flames. It's the only place for people to go who choose to reject God who want to be away from his presence. And God doesn't send anyone to hell, but he can't violate the free will of somebody who is dead set on going there. Why? Because to violate somebody's free will is not loving. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these claims. That God cannot violate our free will, and that to violate our free will to save us from hell would not be loving. My point in this video is not to give conclusive answers. It's more or less to encourage thoughts on these issues and provide alternative ways of thinking about things. I have four topics to converse with you about in this video, and I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Let's talk about free will. What is free will and do we truly have free will? Free will is the idea that we have the ability to choose for or against God. Some Christians would argue that we do not have free will, that God is actually in control of everything, including whether or not we choose him. But most evangelical Christians would agree today that we do have free will. In his book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, Brett Jerzak presents a third point of view. That maybe we don't have free will, but not because God is controlling us, but because our wills are enslaved to sin. The issue at this point becomes free will. We need, even with tongue in cheek, to preserve the possibility that in our humanity, one can behold the love of Christ in all its fullness and still reject it. I say tongue in cheek because it seems to me that absolutely everything in us that says no to perfect love and eternal salvation is not based in freedom, but in bondage. It seems appropriate to ask the question, would anyone with a truly free will say no to God? Would anyone in their right mind choose the opposite of God? Choose death instead of life. Choose fear and hatred instead of love. Choose misery instead of joy and peace. If God is love, joy, peace, bliss, comfort, security, harmony, who in their right mind would not choose these things? Because these are the things that we all want. These are all of our deepest needs. The key here being in our right mind. Or does the New Testament teach that we are in bondage to sin? And if we are in bondage, then how can we also have free will? Jesus says in John 8, 34, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And in verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. So if the problem is that our will is in bondage to sin, then anyone who sins is not truly free to make a healthy, informed choice. And Jesus came to fix that. He spoke of himself as a doctor who had come to heal the sick. In Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5, Jesus says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. So is it possible that without this healing, we don't truly have free will? And then is it possible for Jesus to fail in his mission to free us from bondage so that we can rightly choose? And is it possible that from a healed and truly free will, anyone would choose anything other than God? I'm not arguing for or against free will here. I'm not trying to answer these questions necessarily. 
I have my own opinions, which I've spoken of elsewhere. I'm just gonna leave these questions open-ended for now because my goal is to open up possibilities, not to rule out options. Number two, would God saving us from hell be violating our free will? Jesus said he had come to seek and save that which was lost. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Jesus refers to those living in sin as being lost. So do people who are lost choose to end up lost? If people end up lost, don't they need finding? Does it make sense to say that Jesus finding the lost would be violating our free will? In fact, in the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus said that this is exactly what he does. He goes after every lost sheep. Matthew 18 verse 12, If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the ninety-nine others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? In the same way, it is not my heavenly Father's will that any of these little ones should perish. So we tend to look at the last line. It's not God's will that anyone should perish and ignore the rest of the story. We tend to read the story like this. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Well, he can't violate the free will of the sheep, so it doesn't matter what God's will is. The fact that God doesn't want anyone to perish doesn't count for anything. His hands are tied. If that sheep insists on going his own way and refuses to come back to the presence of the shepherd, well, sadly, there's nothing the shepherd can do about it. Do you see how ridiculous that sounds? How weak our doctrine actually makes God look? Reading the actual parable, it's actually like Jesus is talking to us today with our weak ideas of God's abilities. What it says is, won't he leave the 99 others in the fold and go out to seek for the one that was lost? Like, come on guys, it's so obvious. Of course he will. The sheep doesn't know what he's doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Their minds are enslaved and they're lost. I just want to add a caveat here that I am in no way saying that people can't be lost or that we don't create hells for ourselves in this life and in the next life. I'm also not saying that we aren't responsible for the wrongs that we do, even if we are lost and our wills enslaved. I'm simply raising the question as to whether God going after the lost sheep and doing what he needs to do to heal our minds and release us from bondage is actually a violation of our free will. That would be like saying that a parent going out after a wandering toddler or seeking for their lost child is a violation of the child's free will. Which brings me to my next point. Let's say, the first two points aside, that God saving us from hell is actually violating our free will. Is it appropriate then? for God to violate our free will to save us out of hell? Well, I guess that depends on how we define hell. If hell is a place that people go to who don't want to be in God's presence, as most evangelicals would understand hell today, absolutely, it would be appropriate for God to chase people into the depths of hell. Period. End of story. That is not a violation of free will. Quite the opposite. Generally speaking, those who run into danger after others to save them are considered heroes. For instance, if a fireman or firewoman ran into a burning building to save someone's life and dragged them out kicking and screaming because the person was insane and actually wanted to burn, would we accuse that fireman of violating the person's free will and say that we should have just let them burn because that's what they wanted? This particular argument that God can't violate someone's free will to save them from eternal conscious torment in hell has never made sense to me. And I think there's a lot of people it doesn't make sense to, but we just keep our mouths shut about it because it's the best explanation that we have as to why God would allow somebody to be separated from him eternally and not be able to do anything about it. But maybe, just maybe, if we are having to scramble for explanations, there's something wrong with the picture that we're trying to justify. We can do better. We don't have to accept an explanation just because it's the best one we have, especially if it falls this far short. Saying that God can't save someone from hell because it goes against their free will would be saying that it would be wrong for a parent to restrain a young child from running into oncoming traffic or to pull 
a child who is dead set on jumping into the pool out of the water so that they don't drown. That would be like saying that taking your drug addict teenager and sitting them in the car driving them to rehab would be wrong for violating their free will. To say that we can't help them because that's a violation of their free will, well no it's not. They don't know better. They need help. They need protection. They need somebody to step in. There are times when it is not only appropriate, but it is the loving thing to do to violate someone's free will. How about when using force to restrain criminals? It's not only for the protection of the innocent, but it's also in the best interest of the criminal. And if it's okay to violate people's free will to save them from physical death or from committing heinous acts that will damage their souls, how much more would it be appropriate to violate someone's free will to save them from eternal death, eternal separation from the source of all life? There's a fourth question we need to ask. Would God actually have to violate our free will to save us from hell? We assume that God saving someone from hell automatically requires that he violate that person's free will. But that is a big limit we are putting on God. That's actually quite a small box that we're trying to squeeze God into. Wouldn't God, with his infinite power and wisdom and love and goodness and healing ability, have access to tools that we can't even imagine to save people without violating their free will? I'm not making a definitive statement here that yes, this is the case, but Let's just think about it. Let's open up that possibility. We tend to limit the afterlife choices to two places, heaven and hell. Even though the Bible never does this, and that's a whole other topic that I don't have time to get into in this video. In actuality, we know very little about what comes next. And we really limit God's power and ability by saying it's either heaven or hell, and if someone chooses hell, well, there's nothing God can do. Really? I wouldn't be so sure. The Bible says that God's presence is everywhere, even in Hades or Sheol, and that the powers of hell cannot separate us from the love of God. So based on this definition, hell cannot be a physical location away from God's presence, because such a place doesn't even exist. I tend to think that hell is more a state of mind than a physical location. A state of mind that can't perceive God's presence. After all, Jesus said that to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to repent, which means change our minds. And it is true that love can't be forced and that saving somebody from a state of mind that can't perceive God, that creates an endless cycle of suffering and misery, requires an awakening to love. And the question of whether or not it is even possible to force such an awakening is a valid one. But I have to say, with all of our proclamations of how almighty and all-powerful and unstoppable God is, I'm pretty sure that he could come up with a way to awaken people without forcing them. This is, after all, the nature of love. It satisfies, it fills, it heals, it convinces, it draws, it breaks down walls, it softens hearts. I tend to think that God, who is love, by the way, so he is the healing balm that softens hearts. I tend to think that he has tools at his disposal to reshape and remold and rejuvenate lost souls that we couldn't imagine in our wildest dreams. In the Bible, God is compared to a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap in the book of Malachi indicating that he purifies and cleanses. He is a consuming fire. He burns away the dross and leaves the gold. It's the nature of who he is, and I think that it's ultimately unavoidable. We are all going to be salted with fire, as Jesus said. It's just the nature of how the universe, designed and structured out of love, works. We purify, we progress, we grow, we awaken. It doesn't sound like it's a pleasant process. Sounds like it could be very painful, especially for those who resist, but necessary and inevitable. Certainly better than just abandoning somebody to be eternally lost. In his book, 
Destiny of Souls, Chapter 4, Michael Newton talks about just such things. The remodeling and regenerating and reshaping of the most damaged of souls. I love his books because he gets into so much more detail than even near-death experiencers do. And he talks about places of healing in the hereafter where damaged souls are restored and places of remodeling where severely damaged souls have the evil in them diluted by infusions of fresh energy, all within the bounds of free will. It would be my assumption that for those who insist on going into the depths of hell that God would do what is necessary to heal and restructure and restore these souls and that in such cases, free will might not even be an issue because it would be more like a severely injured or fatally ill or even unconscious person being treated by a doctor. I'm not making a statement one way or another here on whether God violates our free will or not to save us from hell. My personal opinion is that he doesn't need to. I think his love is convincing enough that it draws all of us in the end. I think that he is so much bigger than us that it's like a parent dealing with a trusting but sometimes obstinate child. And free will isn't really an issue because he's so big and so loving and so capable and so good and so comforting and so trustworthy that just who could resist that forever? Especially when he has the infinite healing power of love at his disposal. To close out this video, I'm going to leave you with some quotes from David Bentley Hart's book, that all shall be saved. In response to the idea that allowing people to be eternally separated from God is loving in the sense that it does not violate our free will, David Bentley Hart has this to say. The most popular defense of the infernalist orthodoxy today is also, touchingly enough, the most tender-hearted. The argument, that is, from the rational freedom of the creature and from the refusal of God to trespass upon that freedom, for fear of preventing the creature from achieving a true union of love with the divine, though of course unspeakable consequences await those who fail to do just this, which makes one wonder how neatly such an argument can discriminate between pure love and love motivated by fear. And again, there is no such thing as perfect freedom in this life or perfect understanding, and it is sheer nonsense to suggest that we possess limitless or unqualified liberty. Also, the irresistibility of God for any soul that has truly been set free is no more a constraint placed upon its liberty than is the irresistible attraction of a flowering spring of fresh water in a desert place. To a man who is dying of thirst, to choose not to drink in that circumstance would not be an act of freedom on his part, but only a manifestation of the delusions that enslave him. And again, my point in this video is not to give conclusive answers. My point is to question the ideas that have been grained in us, to open up a conversation here, to present alternative ways of looking at things. And I would love to have this conversation continue in my comment section. I love to hear your thoughts on any of the points discussed in this video. Be loved, be happy, be at peace, and thank you for watching.